Today I'm going to speak to Sean Bailey. Sean is the Conservative candidate to be Mayor of London, and so he was my opponent. I was running as an independent to be Mayor of London against him. And I realised that one of the strange things about politics is that you never have really enough of a chance to sit down and learn about people's lives. That's true particularly when you're running against them, but actually it's often true even when you're working alongside them. So I wanted to get a little bit into who Sean Bailey was and what he'd done before politics. I've tried to keep the interview as non-political as possible. We haven't strayed uh, too much onto um, politics until the very end. But I hope it gives you an insight into something of what has made the man. And I certainly enjoyed it very much. I wasn't, for example, expecting to learn quite so much about gymnastics. If I'd been talking to you when you were 15 years old, uh, what kind of person were you? How would the conversation have gone? What kind of boy were you? Wow, that's a question. I mean, I'm, I'm a Londoner born and bred. I suppose everybody knows that. And I come from West London, Labour Grove, one of the poorest parts of London. Um, I was born in a single parent family. So my dad left very early on and my mum raised me along with my, my, my great uncle and my granddad and my, and my grandparents, etc. I grew up in a London that was a real melting pot, a multicultural London. So for instance, my neighbor across the road was a Polish man, just a few doors down from me, you had the redheads who were also West Indian, but a few doors up, you had the African family. We had a big, um, a big Irish family as well. We had a Portuguese boy at the end of the road as well. And we're surrounded by English children. So it's a very, really melting pot place growing what up. You, what and would your school friends say? What was different between you and the other people in your class? What, what was your personality like? I was a boy who had, who had grown up in a very safe, warm environment until I stepped out, until I was allowed to go out on my own. And so I had two thoughts in my head. Do I want to join this group of boys who were my peer group, who are constantly pressuring you to do things? Or do I want to remain the sort of young, you know, bright-eyed, bushy told lad I was? And, I, and I, th that was a struggle for me. By the time I was 15, of course, I was in the Army Cadet Force as well, and I'd recently started gymnastics. And those formal influences were what, what helped to keep me safe because it was a great... There's a great battle in my head. Do I become one of these street boys or do I become the boy that my parents would like me to be? And it was tough because there was a lot of negative influence at the time. Tell us a bit about the gymnastics. What kind of gymnastics were you doing? So I did, I did six piece gymnastics. I did, I did, I did sports acro. But for me, it was, I was always quite sporty. I come from a family of sports people and it was a, it was a real outlet. But more importantly, I had two coaches, Lisa and Maria, who, who guided me, they were a, a, a more feminine take because I grew up in, on a street very much where everybody's trying to demonstrate how hard they were. And these two women were constantly talking about responsibility. They made me the captain of the team, for instance, which meant I had to look after everybody younger than me. I had to help coach as well. And that environment was very good. And of course they broadened my horizons because when you talk about differences between myself and my peer group, I was able to travel internationally. I, I, I went to Portugal and Spain and, and Denmark. Because, 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 you, because you were, in, you were in doing international gym competitions. Yes, I was doing gym competitions. And, and my coaches were well aware of the positive effect it would have on me. So they do everything. So, I, I don't know anything about gymnastics, Sean. You, you, you take it for granted, but I don't know anything about it. Are you doing things like asymmetric bars were you that, doing that girls, I was more high bars tumbling I'm um, doing balances and lifts but really the gymnastics was an important part it was to me Wait, so you were very good at it right you must have been if you were going I, on I, international I, tours yeah. I would like to believe I, I was I was very good let's see how my coach feels about that yeah. but yes we, we we did lots of competitions and went places but the really important thing was it broadened my horizons and it gave me something to lose or something to gain so often when people are asking me to do what we would call a manoeuvre, I used to think, well, I'll lose my gymnastics place or I can't do it because I'm going to training at night. And the discipline it gave me, the focus it gave me was a real core difference to some of the boys I grew up with. And I think it was a, it gave me a resilience. When people are trying to get me involved in my local gang, when people are trying to get me to sell drugs in particular, which was a regular occurrence for me, because I don't smoke or drink, when the local hoodlums got that knowledge, they used to think, well, Sean won't smoke my profit. And they were constantly trying to draw me in, but I had something else to do. And, and I lent heavily on cadets and gymnastics. Okay, so let's let's move forward from that a little bit. Um, how, how long did you do the gym for? When did you stop training as hard and being less less professional gymnast? 
So I did gymnastics for about 22 years. 22 um, years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was family for me. It, I cannot express to you. I, I had several generations of gymnasts that I was either competing with and against or became a coach for. Um, Lisa and Maria, the girls in my team, the boys in my team, they were, they were, they were literally family for me. I mean, I've got parents to their children now. You know, I've been at weddings and all sorts, and I did it for, for that length of time because, like I say, when people ask you about London, London for me is a physical area, but more importantly, it's a group of people. And gymnastics was a large part of that group of people that I consider family. Let's just sort of focus in on the gymnastics just a little bit more. Um, so could you, I mean, how good were you? Could you, we, I mean, was this a national team or a London team or what? We were a London team. We competed nationally and internationally. We won medals and trophies and all right. sorts. I'd like to believe I was reasonably good. Um, my coach didn't throw me out. So. What, were you, what were you better at and what were you worse at? And what were your strengths and weaknesses as a gymnast? I was definitely a better tumbler. I was a very, uh, a, I was a very competent tumbler. I was very good at that. Now, did you get, was there a sense, I mean, I, I don't know with this, with professional athletes, but there must be a sense where at a certain point in your life, you began to get a sense of where your limits were. And, and was there a moment where you were like, Okay, I'm never going to be as good as this Russian tumbler that I'm looking at in the oh, thing. Oh, oh, oh. Gymnastics is uh, is akin to, to 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 boxing or something like that. It's you versus the other person, and nothing you can do can change their performance, which was important for me because it wasn't so adver adverse real. It was internal. It was what could I do? And when I got to a limit in one type of gymnastics, I swapped to another. And it's just pure joy. You're, you're very fit. You have a great big group of friends. I mean, you know, when you're on a dance floor, you, you, there's an extra move or two you can pull out to impress the girls. You know, it, it was great fun. And for me, it was always a personal endeavor. I didn't mind if people were better around me. I just wanted to push myself. I always wanted to be better than I was. And that was my focus. I, gymnastics gave me a, a belief. Small, constant improvement. Don't aim for per perfection, aim for improvement. And Tell us a little bit about your family. When, when did you meet your wife? How did you meet your wife? So my wife is from sunny Kent. Um, look, I, I was West London. I was a regular and I was a youth worker for, for, for 25 plus years, very long time youth working. And so everywhere in, in that corner of London was my patch. One night I was out. My wife was up in London doing some singing and some re recording. And we, we met in a bar. We had a very good conversation. So um, she's, she's I, a singer still? Or she yeah, was she, she, she'll sing in the choir at church and, and she'll sing to the children, but she, she, it's for her, it's just, you know, she can sing in tune, she loves it, it's fun. It's not something she pursued professionally. But um, it, 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 I, I met a young girl who I, um, I, was, I, was in, I was intrigued by, I was overwhelmed by. I begged and begged for her number. <laughs> and, um, she, she, uh, I gave her mine in the end and, and three whole weeks later, I remember it because it was agonizing weight. She called me back and we had a date and, and the rest is history. I, I suppose we, you know. Um, How old are your children? My children are 11 and 13. Wow, wow, wow. okay. And have you got a sense what they're going to do? Are they beginning to get a sense where they'd like to go in life or what kind of their ambitions are? Or what? I think my daughter, my daughter is what I call a Bachelor of the Arts. She's a very keen reader. She likes to write. She's very expressive in, in, in that sort of English and, and history is, is the way she wants to go. My son is very academic. He's more academic than my daughter maybe in that he's what I call a bachelor of science. He's, he's very good at art. He's very good at um, maths, excuse me. We build um, gliders and radio control cars together. He's a massive Lego enthusiast. He likes logical things and I think those two sort of core traits will dictate what they pursue in the future. I wanted to come at from a slightly different angle. Um, if your mother, for example, were reading people writing about you, are there things about you that she'd feel that they don't really understand or they're not really picking up on that she'd want to emphasize? Or people who've known you all your life and your great uncle or someone would be like, no, 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 that's what you're missing about Sean is this. I think I think the answer to that question would be, my mum has often said to me, I, I, they don't understand how hard you've tried, that you've just gone out and tried. I, a lots of times where it hasn't gone my way, but I've just kept going. And that personal resilience was, I think, was given to me by my mum and my wider community, that support. And my mum's always said, I wish people would understand that you were in a group of children, that the women 
of, of our community were always trying to push forward and we dealt with a lot of disappointment and a lot of hardship, but we always kept you going. I, I think that's important because that resilience piece is one of the things I want to spread across London. If you come from a poor community and people continually talk to you about being disadvantaged, that becomes your self-belief. And my mum wanted everybody to know I never viewed myself as disadvantaged because she wouldn't allow it. Yes, I had extra challenges to overcome, but she kept letting me know you have a talent. Um, I have a belief in you move forward. And I think that's important if you want our children from so-called disadvantaged backgrounds to move forward. And should, yeah. Give us a bit more of a sense then of your life during your 20s so uh, there, there were you presumably in addition to your youth work you did many other different types of work like wow. many people in London so give, give us a sense of the variety of things you did Rory you have no idea <laughs> my 20s was uh, a time of joy in one sense and a time of real hardship but I, I buckled down and I got on it got on with it so for instance life was so tough I didn't get to university until I was 23 and that was because of just been, been financially hard up as it were. I was unemployed at that time. I was a sofa serving homeless at that time. And, and that really made life hard. So I couldn't concentrate on, on getting a, a higher education. I just to concentrate on surviving. Talk, talk, talk me through the sofa serving, Sean. What, what happened? You were generally s staying with friends? Is that, is oh, that how? I, I, stayed with, I stayed with friends, I stayed with relatives. Because the thing is, I was born into council housing. And at the time, as it is much now, a single man was never going to get housed. They moved my mother, so then I was sort of out on my own. And I, for a long, long period, for, for the better part of nine, almost 10 years, I sofa served. So I stayed with friends for two or three weeks. I stayed with, with a very good friend, Alex, for maybe two years. I stayed with another friend, Scott, for a very long period of time. But I, I had a lot of time. And, and, of and friends like that. that. Just, just. Friends like Alex and Scott were people that you'd grown up with or that you'd met through gymnastics or that you'd I mean, met in engagement? Scott, I'd grown up with him. He's, he's, a, he's a local lad. He was the best man at my wedding. I, I, he's, he's, a close, he's as close as a friend could be. And Alex, I met at university. And, you know, he became a very close friend at that time in my life. But it was, it was tough. I mean, if I go back slightly earlier than that, I was unemployed. And I did a lot of, of, of temping. And, you know, you just turn up in the morning to the temping agency and you'd hope that they'd have some work for you. And, and that was quite a stressful time. The agency were, were a decent bunch. If you were a regular, they tried to regularly employ you. What sort of things were you doing in the temp agency? Oh, just, just give me I, a sense. I delivered beer. I swept factories. I was a cleaner. I worked on building sites. I did all manner of things just to keep going. Eventually, I was a security guard for a very long period of time. I did that all the way through university to sort of, you know, feed myself and, and buy books, et cetera. But it was, to me, it was tough, but it was also life. It, everybody I knew was, 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 as we'd call it, on the grind. And I just thought to myself, I have a choice here. I can sit down and lament what isn't happening, or I can try to make something happen. And my mum was constantly saying, do the work. And people around me were, were saying, look, you can do it, Sean. You, you've got two brain cells. You know, work, work, work. And, and the, the important thing was, when I was sofa surfing, that was a real demonstration of my community trying to help me. You know, they were saying, look, you, you're a good one. We'll do our little bit, whatever that little bit is. You know, people tried to give me work. People gave me food, all kinds of things. But what, we did that all the time. What, what did you learn with all these different small jobs about management? What, what did you learn about bosses? What, what did you learn about good and bad bosses? I learned that a good or bad boss can really make or break your day, week, month, year. For instance, I, had a, I worked at Wembley as a security guard at Wembley for a long period of time. I had a boss called Mark and I had a boss called Pat. They were really good to me. They did everything they could to get me hours so I could study. They let me work a Friday because it worked well with university. I had other bosses who treated me so badly. It was incredible. But what that meant was they would never... They, they couldn't build morale. They didn't know how to support people. Nobody was willing to help them. And it taught me an important lesson. If you want people to help you, it's very important the way you interact with them. So fast forward then to um, your, and we're now going a long way forward, to, to you then ending up as a special advisor in number 10. Um, I, I don't know whether you are or are not going to be prime minister one day, but what, what lessons did you draw about management there? Because this is one of the big questions in government. Uh, it doesn't matter who's in, Labour, Conservative, whatever. Number 10 always seems to be a bit of a mess, right? And 
politicians are not often very well associated with managing things. In fact, I, I don't know, but I mean, did you, for example, feel that Pass at Wembley had a better idea on how to manage things than actually it turned out people did when he turned up in number 10 or not? I mean, what, what was the sense of the culture there? I think the challenge for British politics is our system. How do we re- retain continuity without giving away that political control? Because when people vote Labour, Conservative or whoever, they're voting for that. And often we go back to the system and the system trundles along and does what it wants to do anyway. I mean, if you compare it to the American system, you bring in your whole sort of top level of advisors and what we would consider civil servants, and they do the government's bidding. In our system, it's a bit more, a lot more actually, of a negotiation between the new administration and the civil service. And I think that could do the tweak as, you know, in our modern democracy going going forward. But did you think, I mean, did you think that things were well run? I mean, when you got into the heart of government, did you think, my goodness, this is a kind of... Rolls Royce machine, or did you think, well, wait a second, I thought this was going to be amazing, and now I've come in from the outside, and this is a bit weird. There's definitely bits of it I thought were really well run that was surprising to me. There was other bits that I thought, wow, this is going to make getting anything done very tough. The reason I got involved in politics is so that people from my background who understand the struggle of the struggles of life could have a voice at the top table and and ask for the system to be quick, faster. I remember the the biggest thing I thought at the time was you have to make it easier to get off and on to benefits, which for for a conservative is a very surprising thing to say. But I was saying to people, if you want people to try and work, you have to make the leap from benefits into work less scary, more possible, and that makes speed. And I could see how the system was slightly confused by somebody asking these types of questions. There was many a times I challenged what was the, the norm with what was my very street-based, real-life take on, in, on the world. What, and it, and what, it, it did great, I can see that. Did, did you develop particular friends or mentors when you came in, people that you particularly got to know, advisors or politicians who, you, in the end, you felt you really hit it off with? Did you, did you make friends during that period that have lasted? I made a number of friends, actually, that lasted. So um, Craig Oliver, uh, he was uh, director of communication at number 10. He and I made an immediate connection because he could see that I understood what, what people outside of politics who weren't very interested in it. He could see I could communicate with them and what they wanted to talk about. Ian Duncan Smith was a, a good connection, one that I retain today, because he was looking at modifying the benefit system. So I was very anxious to have a, a voice in that conversation as well and he you felt he was a good listener and he took on your ideas and... he, he, he certainly would give me time and listen to me um david cameron was the same as well he often would ask me questions he'd question the room and then direct the question again to me which i found interesting george osborne would often make the points to me for me he'd often write me an email and say sean here's the government announcement and, and here's why which i which i found very very interesting that he'd take the time to, to sense check it as it as a, as it were with me. I'm not saying they always listen to yeah. my opinion, but I'm saying they definitely would 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 would, would include me in the in the conversation, which I found quite good. There's a number of senior civil servants as well who uh who were very they 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 would seek me out and we'd have the conversation about what they had planned. And I found that very very inspiring, very gratifying. And do you think in another life you might ever have considered being a civil servant? Is that something that's ever interested you? Or? I, like, I, like, I like impact. I like a quick pace of change. And our civil servants are brilliant at one thing, and that's continuity. But continuity often has a speed deficit, and I like to make change now. When, when you are poor, you've, you very quickly understand that the change you need is today, not tomorrow. And, that, and I carry that in my heart for politics. I want a politics that is full of impact, and I want a politic that doesn't care who came up with the idea. I don't care if it's Labour, Conservative. I just want to do the right thing and I want to do it quickly. And I think sometimes being a civil servant might make that difficult. And what, are there any things in the, your life or that you've seen that you think are funny or weird that the public don't quite understand when they look from the outside? Things that you think are just sort of bizarre or humorous? or I tell you, I have been on stages. I introduced the Prime Minister one year at conference. I've been at events where I've been in, introduced as a special advisor to the PM and I've had to pinch myself because coming from where I've come from to then be the Conservative candidate for Mayor of London to be special advisor to the Prime Minister is a very long, um, complicated, pleasurable 
journey, but it is a journey. And sometimes I've had to pinch myself and it has, it, it, it has often, it has felt funny that I, for instance, have been able to challenge the Home Secretary or challenge the PM. Sometimes being that little boy from West London makes that feel funny. Um, do you, when you were setting, let's go back to setting up your charity and doing youth work. What do you think people who just hear the phrase youth work, what do you think they don't understand about it? What, what, what might they misunderstand about what youth work is about? Do you think people maybe have a mistaken idea about it? I think, I think why youth work has become a bit of a hackneyed phrase is because people just say it for the welfare of young people. But what does that mean? In my community, where you had a very tough community, you had some children who are willfully criminally involved and have a large group of people who had been sucked into that, that meant lots of tough conversations. It meant lots of myth busting as well. So I always tell people, if you think youth work is biscuits and table tennis, you're wrong. I mean, I, I, I had to break up fights. I, I remember going to meet one of my young people and having a fist fight with a drug dealer. I had to be, the drug dealer hit me, so then all three of us were involved in the fight. I remember going to the police station and, and to collect a young person. And this policeman saying, I'm so glad you're here. And I said, why? He said, because this child's parents clearly don't want him. And that's a very, very tough conversation to have with someone and not leave them feeling vulnerable. You have to have that conversation and give them some sense of hope that they can take care of their future, as opposed to people just saying, oh, it's youth work, the state will look after you. I had to say to that young man, we're going to have to build a, 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 a future for you and you're going to absolutely have to be in the driving seat of that. You're going to have to believe that you can succeed. Who in your experience you can't? Who in your experience was really good at it? What, what, what's the character of a really good youth worker? Were the people that you worked with where you were like, that person is amazing? That's I mean, I could shout some people out. Mutaz, um, Saskia, Lynn, Susanna. Um, I could tell you a hundred people. And what, what, what made them great? You can't teach the thing they had. They had a way of <clears throat> using their life experiences, good or bad, and giving them over positively. So they could tell a young person a horrific tale but end positively and say to young people that the, 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 the point of this tale that you can do better. They also had great empathy and they didn't crusade for the young people. They didn't, they, they let the young people crusade for themselves. They were always saying, I'm setting you up to go on. They weren't trying to, to, to convey their politics onto this young person or through this young person. They were trying to say, you can do this yourself. And also as well, when I, I employed a youth worker, and I, I asked, so I did it through volunteers and I said to the young people, which one of these volunteers should we keep on? And they unanimously picked Saskia. And I said, why? Why have you picked Saskia? And I never forget it. One of them said to me, she never judges us. And another kid just said, she likes us, Sean. And when you have that, when you have people in the world constantly telling you you're disadvantaged, you're unpleasant to be around, you'll never amount to anything. A person who likes you, doesn't judge you and tries to move you forward is absolutely golden. How about the bureaucracy and the paperwork of running a charity in Youthwork? I, I, I set up a charity in Afghanistan and it, it give us a sense of that. Give us a sense of what it feels like to have to wade through all that and set it up. You asked me what I was like when I was 15. Uh, let me fast forward to about 20 years when I really got into, I've got to get my own sort of gig yeah. going here. Yeah. I was a doer. I was walking into the, to the job centre, taking the cards out, putting them in my rucksack and walking up and down my local streets, handing them out and filling them in for people. So fast forward another two years when people are asking me to fill in application forms for, for, for funding. They're asking me to sign rent agreements and all the rest of that. That really bogged me down. But this is where community becomes important because I found people from my community who weren't from my background. I found a guy called Nigel, who was a, a lawyer who helped me with those kind of things. And I have a woman called Corinne, who was a banker, who became, they both became trustees, so they could shepherd me through this absolute blizzard of paperwork because they could see my value was face to face with the young people, not sitting in my office filling in paperwork. So they took that on for me. And again, it's, an, it, it's a real demonstration of no matter where you are, who you are, you have some value to young people in need. And fundraising, I mean, is, it, is that sort of work mostly council contracts or is it stuff where you have to go and do endless philanthropic fundraising? Are you fundraising all the time? Is it that kind of charity or? did it or we um so great big people like Campton charities gave us money bbc children in need but also did private individuals as well 
And that meant a lot of what I call tap dancing, you know, going out, explaining who you are, what you're about. But the thing that we did very successfully was engage our young people in raising their own funds. So, for instance, we did an international trip with the Royal Geographic Society and our young people raised every penny. Of Where did you go? Um, so they went to uh, Madagascar. They went to Svalbard, which is in the Arctic Circle. And they also went to the Amazon as well. We did it over a number of years. We did groups over a number of years. Oh, how amazing. It was amazing, but the amazing piece for me was those young people weren't allowed to make excuses. They were given help and they absolutely went for it and they raised their money, they did the trip. And every one of those young people, four years after, was still in work. And I believe the process they went through changed their mindset to one where they thought, I can and will support myself. I'm talking to the United States. We've just been through this whole thing of storming Congress and the last moments of Donald Trump. Have you got any reflections on... Um, what Donald Trump means in terms of modern politics? Are there things that make you think about things that worry you about the direction of politics? About, I mean, do you reflect on him a little bit or is that? People are very tired of this highly personalised adversarial um, politics. People just don't like it. They've turned off. And it's, it's funny, Rory. I remember when you, when you saw the mayor of London, everybody rushed over and said, oh my gosh, look what Rory's doing to you. Da, 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 da. And I said, Rory isn't doing anything to me at all. What Rory's doing is being fresh ideas to a city that desperately needs them. I welcome that, let's get on with it. And people were surprised. And the way that you and I conducted ourselves, I'm very proud of because I had a young person say to me, Rory used to be in your party. And I stopped him and I said, Rory is trying to help all of us develop London. And I think that's the way to go. You should be able to have political debates with people no matter what their beliefs are. You shouldn't be no platforming people. You shouldn't be attacking people. You should scrutinize the ideas and that's all you should do. But sure. One of the, I mean, obviously I agree with you very strongly, but one of the sad things is you sometimes get a sense that bad behavior is rewarded. Yes. That, yes. that there's a reason why people go for very aggressive, negative campaigning, divisive politics, because it kind of gets results. It works for them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think ultimately it turns people off. And what it does as well, it, it means that no politician will ever be successful because you've created such a divide. If, if I was to make the political point, one of the things we're suffering from now in London is the fact that we have a mayor who's been very divisive. So anything from supporting one set of supporters to not supporting another, anything around this rewriting of our history in London, they're very divisive um, political statements, public statements to be making. And when I've said to people, look, you may be a died in the wall Labour voter, you may be a Lib Dem, whatever. What I'm trying to do is bring us together people have, have warmed and responded to that because they know in a city of nine million people, if that's ever going to work, we have largely got to be moving in the right direction. And, and, and the public are not quite as naive and, and, and as misled as people believe. They can see when things, things need change. And I sense in London that we need to change. And do you think, I mean, it's, it's a very uh, complicated issue, this, isn't it? But Presumably, were you to become mayor, one of the things that you feel that you could do is become a voice for communities that haven't been represented before. Is that right? Yes. I think the whole point of being a, a voice for communities that haven't been represented, what I bring to the table is understanding what it is to, to, to come from a minority position, what it is to need to make your voice heard. But also, I'm very proud of my Britishness. I'm also very proud of the work I've done to bring communities together. I remember someone challenging me about crime and what I do. And I said, the first one I do is back the police. I've done it before. On my local level, I worked very closely with the police, which was sometimes very hard to sell to the group of young people I was working for. But ultimately, over years, I demonstrated the benefit of that. And representing people who are not, who are not regularly heard is key, but also tying the larger, you know, what mainstream Britain, London into that conversation is key too because we don't want to suffer from the tyranny of the minority or the tyranny of the majority, we to bring people together. It is my true, it is my, my heartfelt belief that we have far, far more in common than we have in difference, and we should be working on that. And do you, I mean, have there been times in your life where you felt um, particularly kind of criticised by people from the left who are disappointed that you're not on the left Disappointed that you're not making more left-wing comments. I mean, is, is that has that been a theme in your life? Oh my gosh, from from day one, people have said to me, "Why are you conservative? Or when did you realise you're conservative? Or you're not a usual conservative?" And there's there's things I'd say to that. Firstly, I am a very typical conservative in that 
conservatism had been a very working class thing in Britain and clearly from the working classes. I say to the black community as well, anybody who tells you you cannot be a conservative, you need to worry about that because they're trying to control how you think. And if our community needs anything, it's a freedom to think for itself. It's a, it's a freedom to, be, to, to have, to have self-belief, which means you must have self-propelled ideas. And that's very, very important. I've been attacked wildly on the left. I had a Labour MP recently call me a token ghetto boy. All you have to do is read my, my, my Twitter feed to see people telling me off for, for not being on the left. People saying to me, but you're black, how can you be a Tory? And I'd say to them as well, the, the core values of being a Tory, you know, believing in family, believing in country, believing in the rule of law, believing in the, in the sanctity and the dignity that work provides, they're not just Tory views. They're, they're, they're for me, they're, 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 they're core views to who I am, they're core views to what this country is, what largely the Western world is. So I believe black or white, young or old, gay or straight, you should have access to those views. And anybody who tells you you automatically can't, they're hoodwinking you. They're trying to deny your freedoms. They're trying to control the way you think. And I've always thought that's wrong. And Sean, the, um, did, did you, I mean, the community that you, or your friends when you were growing up, people, how political were they? Or are many people just not that interested in politics anyway? I mean, I know there's an idea, obviously, that people who are attacking you have that you ought to be on the left. But maybe the truth of the matter is that Many people are just not that into politics, whether left or right or whatever. They're just, it's not their thing. It's complicated. So on a day-to-day -day basis, nobody cares about politics. They're not sitting there reading the newspaper and wondering about the big debate for the day. But on a very on a on a on a very day-to-day -day basis, they are. It's poor people who are most exposed to politics. Things like, you know, the economy affects poor people first. Um, housing policy affects poor people first. What we do the NHS affects poor people first. So in one sense, they're very, very political. When you talk about the community I come from, largely Labour voting, um, it, it's a statistical fact that many people in the black community, particularly the West Indian community, vote Labour. But never once have I lost the argument. And people don't tell me I can't be a Tory for my own community. They ask me why. When I explain, I win the argument because they know that they want their families to live an independent life. And that's what that's what I'm about. I don't want them to be dependent. I want my community. I don't want my community's income to be welfare. I want the sky to be the limit and beyond. And that means for me being a Tory. That means for me having some responsibility to your family, to your local community and to the country at large. And Sean, finally, just to sort of wrap up, is there a particular city apart from London, somewhere else in the world, another capital city that you visited? And that you enjoyed and can you tell us a little bit about what you loved about that other capital city what what it had there that you think inspired you that you might bring if you were mayor of london or maybe not no maybe not, not a direct parallel with london but just somewhere you've been where you think it's got something to it there's something i enjoy about this there's something i i've got a list uh, uh, of cities uh, around the world that I've, I've really admired so I went to New York. I've been to New York a number of times. I just love the hustlers in New York. It reminds me of London, actually. People always on the cutting edge, trying to find something new to do, to build. And I, I love that. And that's a notion that I will always build in London and keep pumping up in London. I've been to Madrid, which I really like because I love their city squares, the way that they can pedestrianise a place. I think there's something we could do in London as well. And of course, fabulous food. I, I really, really love the food. In, in, are, are you a cook? Do you cook? I'm more baked than a cook. I'm more you, baked than a cook. I saw you flipping pancakes on Shrove Tuesday. That's right. Been, I'm, I like to bake because, quite frankly, I've got a sweet tooth. But yeah, I'm more of a baker than a cook. Okay, well, listen, Sean, thank you. That was really kind. It was lovely to, to have a chance to talk to you and, and really, really good luck.